Okay. So thank you guys for uh, coming today to, to hear my short presentation. Um, I know it's the last beautiful day in Berlin, if you're in Berlin before weeks, maybe a week of rain. So um, thank you very much for coming. I'm just gonna give a short introduction to some of the themes of my book and uh, then take questions and talk about it. Um, I'm gonna make a little bit of reference to the, the pandemic economy, which of course has been the economy for over a year now. Um, so the, the main starting point for the book is the rise of what I call a new automation discourse. It's just, you know, book after book coming out a year after year on this idea that we're living in an age of incredible technological breakthroughs that you know, advanced industrial machinery, artificial intelligence, especially in the form of um, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, and the platform economy are just radically changing the conditions of work. So much so, in fact, these authors say that we are heading towards a workless future. That is to say that according to all of these books that I kind of consider the automation discourse, and it's not just academic books, it's popular books, it's also newspapers and other forms of media saying that um, we live in an age of increasing technological unemployment. So that's the kind of theory or thesis that I am uh, considering in my book. Like, is this right? Is this the correct way to think about what's going on in the economy today and thinking about the future of work? Um, now, of course, this has taken on a special salience during the coronavirus pandemic because many authors were claiming, and you saw this in the Financial Times, as well as across all other kinds of media, that the coronavirus pandemic was going to be a kind of a major um, uh, moment in this coming wave of automation. And as all these people are taken out of the workforce, they're going to be increasingly replaced by robots. Like for example, the screening robot in Antwerp, which was meant to you know, reduce human contact in the midst of a pandemic. Now, um, you know, as evidence for the claims that these authors make, they frequently cite this idea of rising technological unemployment. Now, this isn't a graph of any connection to technology, but just thinking about unemployment itself, it's definitely the case. If you look at the kind of um, lines uh, to the left-hand side, the line on the left-hand side of this graph, what you see is that in the past, in the United States, this is just the official US unemployment rate since 1947, spikes of unemployment used to be very thin, which meant that the labor market would generate unemployment and then it would quickly recover. And you see kind of from the 70s onward, those thin spikes become wide wedges, which means that it's taking longer and longer for the economy to recover uh, or the, the labor market to recover from recession. So that's kind of what people mean when they talk about a jobless recovery is those, the widening of those wedges over time. And of course, as you can see on the right-hand side of the, the graph, um, we've seen the most incredible high unemployment uh, since they started recording these numbers in the US during the coronavirus pandemic. And of course, again, not due to automation, this recent spike in unemployment, but the idea is that somehow this is going to presage, right, further unemployment as we transition to the automated economy. Now, the problem here isn't only about unemployment. It's not only about people who've lost their jobs to technology, um, these authors also, uh, oh, this is just another graph of um, uh, jobless recovery, so I'll skip that for now. Um, oh yeah, anyway, so uh, I'll, I'll talk more about, uh, about other trends like underemployment and rising inequality, which um, are also frequently cited, right? Not just a rise in the unemployment rate, but increasing job insecurity and especially rising uh, inequality and of course, as people know, this has only accelerated in the last year with um, some of the richest people in the world, their uh, total wealth has just skyrocketed in the course of the coronavirus pandemic. And you have this kind of image of the future, which is these kind of tech barons like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos competing in the global space race, private space race to like achieve or, or to fling humanity off the earth to other planets. So these are the kind of things that I talk about in my book, Automation of the Future of Work. It's a very short book. The text is only about 100 pages, and then there's about 60 pages of footnotes. Uh, and it came out uh, in November of last year. Um, in order to evaluate the kind of claims that these automation theorists are making, 
I look at um, two different sectors of the economy in particular. I look at the manufacturing sector and then at the service sector. Um, now, most people in the economy work in services and most of the automation claims are precisely about this coming roboticization of the service sector, right? All these jobs like lawyers and radiologists are gonna be replaced by AI and um, intelligent machines. But one of the big claims I make is that actually the first place we should look for the evidence of this uh, account is in the manufacturing sector because there the jobs apocalypse has already taken place. Um, so the story about how automation has affected the manufacturing sector plays a key role in the story that these authors are telling about what's going to happen. The story about what happened to manufacturing in the past plays a key role in their account of what's going to happen to services in the future. Now, there's a few reasons why manufacturing is a good place to look for evidence of this. One, which you have depicted here, is just that uh, it's very easy to measure the extent of roboticization in manufacturing. So this is a very common uh, graph. It just comes from the International Federation of Robots and it measures the number of installed robots per, uh, per uh, 1,000 workers in the manufacturing sector in 2016. In my presentation, I'm gonna focus on three countries which you have highlighted there, Germany, Japan, and the United States. And you can see that um, these are among the most roboticized countries in the world. You can also see that you know, at, at the top of the ranks are, are, are countries with large multi international multinational um, companies like South Korea, Singapore, and Japan, and East Asia, and Germany, Sweden, and Denmark in Europe. Notice that the United States is not at the front of the pack. It's actually rather lagging behind some of its European and um, East Asian competitors. Now, as I mentioned, another reason to focus on manufacturing is that there the jobs apocalypse has already taken place. We've seen, especially since the late 1960s and then in the 70s, continuing on into the 80s and 90s, wave after wave of deindustrialization. Deindustrialization is typically measured as or defined as a, as a steady decline in the share of manufacturing employment and total employment. And what I'm kind of depicting here in a stylized way is that there, these waves of deindustrialization have washed over the economy and have even affected many uh, developing countries sort of surprisingly early in the process of their development, according to the language of the economist. So that's called premature deindustrialization um, in the literature. And you can kind of see that represented here by South Africa and Brazil. Now, every time I present this, people say, well, what about China? Isn't it because all jobs are moving to China? It's actually more complicated than that. China itself deindustrialized uh, in the 1990s and more jobs were lost there than you know, have been lost basically in the United States, a huge number of jobs in total. Um, but then in 2003, China began to rapidly industrialize as its share of world markets for manufacturers grew significantly. But that period only lasted about a decade. And since 2013, China has also been deindustrializing, and so is India. And in fact, according to the United Nations, the entire world has been deindustrializing for about eight years now. So this is a global trend. And again, the question is, is this explained by automation? Is automation the global mechanism, right, that is affecting all of these countries? So um, in order to start to answer that question, of course, the book provides a lot more. I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of evidence here. So what you need to know to understand this is a very simple equation that actually appears on the first page of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. He says, what determines the wealth of nations? It's two things. It's the size of the workforce and the productivity of the workers. So that actually translates into a stylized equation, which um, you can kind of see reproduced here in a minute. That is that the, the rate of growth of output in any sector of the economy, here we're gonna talk about manufacturing, is equal to the rate of growth of productivity plus the rate of growth of employment. So you can think of it this way, if you have a factory that's increasing its production of cars by 3% per year, that could be because, for example, productivity is growing at 3% and employment isn't growing at all because three uh, equals three plus zero. Or it could be you have a car factory increasing output by 3% per year, no productivity growth. That must mean that employment grew by 3% per year. So it's an identity, it's an identity. O equals P plus E. 
So what you can see here on the right-hand side of the graph, what I've revealed or chart, what I've revealed is just that employment has been falling in the USA, Japan, and Germany since the 1970s in the manufacturing sector steadily, you know, by about a percent or two per year over time. So very significant deindustrialization over time. Now, if this were due to automation, what you'd expect to see is that labor productivity growth would be the cause of this trend. Now, people sometimes find that a little confusing. Aren't we talking about workers being replaced by machines? Why would their labor productivity be growing? But labor productivity statistics don't measure what economists call the marginal productivity of workers. It's not an attempt to capture what this worker is contributing, right? It's actually just a measure of output divided by workers or worker hours. So even if you were replacing a lot of workers with machines, it would show up in the statistics, it would appear, appear like the remaining workers were becoming ever more efficient because the total amount of value is being divided now by fewer and fewer workers. So is that what's happening in the economy? No, that's not what's happening at all. In fact, productivity growth has been, according to the official statistics, relatively stable in the United States. I cite a number of economists who actually suggest that these numbers are inflated and that they're really um, biased toward a particular way US statisticians measure um, uh, productivity growth in the computer sector. But what you can see, especially for other countries um, here, Germany, Japan, is that actually productivity growth rates are falling over time. Productivity growth has been lower in recent periods than in the past. You might say, well, isn't that because Germany and Japan just caught up to the West? But remember, Germany and the first graph I showed you, Germany and Japan actually have way more installed robots per worker than the United States. They're actually far ahead of the US in terms of roboticization, but they actually have uh, low falling rates of productivity growth and more workers in manufacturing in terms of their share than in the US. So what's the real cause of falling uh, employment? It's actually just falling rates of output growth. What you can see in the left-hand side of the chart here is just a really significant slowdown in the rate of growth of manufacturing output. That means that it's not that productivity growth is leaping upward in manufacturing. It's rather that the rate of expansion of manufacturing in each of these countries is slowing down more and more. You can notice, um, I'll talk, I can talk about this in questions, but note that in Germany, it hasn't been a secular decline. Germany, since around 2000, has just uh, revived its export engine. It's become a major player in international markets. So it's a little bit less affected by these trends, but I can explain how that fits into the story. Um, a big part of my account is to say, look, this isn't only happening in the USA, Germany, and Japan. This trend towards falling output growth, falling rates of expansion in manufacturing affects the entire world economy. This chart is from the World Trade Organization or from data from the World Trade Organization. And what it shows is that the period of globalization, which economists said was going to be a period of specialization, gains from trade, rapid growth, actually saw a significant decline in rates of output growth in manufacturing for the entire world. Why? I say that's because globalization generated more trade redundancies than trade complementarity. So companies across the world were producing the same sorts of goods in markets that became increasingly overcrowded rather than specializing in different goods and kind of benefiting one another through trade. So we saw a decline in rates of growth, not an increase as the economists would expect. Now, the reason why this is important to the overall story is that what happened in manufacturing is that the, the, growth, the growth engine of capitalist economies for the past 200 years has really been in manufacturing. And a lot of that has actually been due to trade. It's export-led, industrial-led growth. And what's happened in this era of globalization, it's not just that the technological frontier is being pushed outward, it's that technologies are diffusing across the world and that has made industrial markets more crowded and the result of that is that it has killed i say the industrial growth engine countries like china that have grown very quickly in a slow growing global economy have done it mostly by taking market share away from other countries so it's become a kind of zero sum game when it comes to high speed growth uh, and the reason why that's relevant for the overall story what well, you can see here on the left hand side of this chart mva is just output in manufacturing, manufactured value added. It's just the rate of expansion of output I showed you before. 
And what you can see is that it's declined over time, as I mentioned. On the right-hand side, you have GDP, and that's the rate of growth of the economy as a whole. And what you can kind of see here is that as manufacturing has declined, the rate of growth of the entire economy has slowed down. So the argument I'm making here is that when industry stopped functioning as a growth engine for the economy, nothing was able to replace it. Instead, the entire economy slowed down and we entered this process that economists call, though they explain it differently, secular stagnation. So I'm kind of giving you here a social structural explanation for what the economists call secular stagnation. Notice that even though Germany turned the tide a little bit in terms of MVA after 2001, that didn't affect the long-term trend in GDP because manufacturing is made up of a smaller and smaller share of the economy. So even when it does grow a little faster, it's not able to have the same effect on the, on the growth rate for the overall economy that it once did. Now, this trend of slowing growth in the whole economy I'm going to argue that that's really what's causing the labor market trends that the automation theorists are attributing to rapid technological change. And a big part of my argument, you can see here. So look at the right hand side first. This is productivity for the whole economy, not just for the manufacturing sector. And you can see here that actually that trend of slowing productivity growth that I pointed out in manufacturing is much more severe in the economy as a whole. And that's actually because services tend to have slower productivity growth on average in the long term. That's a phenomenon called Baumol's cost disease. It's a really important um, part of how I and many others think about what's going on in the service sector. So as the manufacturing growth engine has become dilapidated, services have failed to replace it in large part because services see such low rates of productivity growth. As the economy has switched to services, we see slower and slower rates of productivity growth for the economy as a whole. And again, this is worse in the countries that actually have more robots, right? The more robot countries like Germany and Japan actually have worse rates of productivity growth, not better. We don't see a qualitative shift toward higher productivity growth. We actually see stagnation. And that's reflected in the capital stock, which is the left-hand side there. That's just the rate of accumulation of capital. It's like the addition to the total value of machinery, plants, and equipment, and software in the economy. And what you can see is that actually, in this context of slowing growth, private investors, firms, capitalists, whatever you want to call them, are actually investing less and less in the economy. So the capital stock is growing less and less quickly over time. Thinking about what that means, you know, when the business news, like the BBC says, Will COVID-19 speed up the use of robots and replace human workers? What we should think about is the fact that actually in the past 20 years or even 30 years, what we've seen is a significant fall in the rate of investment in things like robots and other kinds of equipment. In fact, the last decade, the 2010s, it was supposed to be the decade of the most massive transformation in machinery in the economy, saw the worst uh, rates of growth of the capital stock since they started recording the numbers. It's just devastating how little investment took place during that decade. And again, that corresponds to the very low rates of productivity growth and output growth for the economy as a whole. Um, and of course, this is the, the chart I thought I was gonna show up earlier. That's reflected not only in higher rates of unemployment, as I mentioned before, um, but the slower growth of the economy and just greater insecurity for workers, more difficulty finding jobs has resulted in a growing gap between productivity growth and wages for workers. And it's even worse when you look not at average wages, which is the dotted line, but the median wage, which is more representative you know, of the average in the sense we think of it, workers' actual income, the 50th percentile worker has really seen stagnation since the mid 2000s, since basically the, 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 the big crisis uh, in 2008. So this is contributing to rising inequality. You can basically explain, my argument is you can explain a lot of the trends that the automation theorists attribute to a qualitative breakthrough in technology just by this process of stagnation and looking at its social structural roots in this overcapacity problem in industry, the killing of the industrial growth engine and the absence of anything to replace it. Let me just say, I'm not saying that automation isn't taking place. Automation is always happening in the economy. Innovations that replace workers are always happening. 
the claim I'm making is actually that that is happening at a slower pace than before. It's like automation is actually slowing down today compared to the past. So it can't be the explanation for why workers are having so much trouble finding work. Now in the book here, I'm just finishing up. I talk about a bunch of government responses to this and I talk, I put it in the context of like science fiction dystopias, like, you know, I hear this show 3%, um, which is a kind of weird Brazilian meritocratic story about favelas and high inequality in the global South. Um, but I talk about a lot of other kind of sci-fi themes in the book. And I also discuss a number of government um, uh, interventions in the midst of this, you know, so if, if, if the economy is slowing down and capitalists or firms are not investing as much as they used to, what have governments done to try to fix this? I talk about efforts at Keynesian demand stimulus. I talk about neoliberal structural adjustment. And I talk about new proposals for a universal basic income and how we should think of them in light of this social structural story about slowing economic growth. In the book, I also talk about the kind of wild utopian fantasies of the automation theorists, their dream of a post-scarcity economy. And I explain how, in my view, actually the kinds of things they're talking about, a world in which everyone's needs are met, a world in which work is no longer the center of our identities, a world in which, you know, the economy is repurposed to be focused on pleasure, fun, human purpose beyond work, and so on. We can actually achieve all those things, I argue, even without the automation of the economy by rather focusing on redistributing the work that has to be done in a slow growing economy, redistributing and transforming that work and meeting everyone's needs um, to the extent that we're able. And that's also the topic of a book that I'm writing kind of sequel to the automation book. So that's my very brief presentation. I hope that um, you got something out of it and I'm excited to uh, hear your comments and maybe answer some questions. Mm -hmm.